All right, good afternoon, everybody. So, as most of you know, um, one of my parts, um, one of my thoughts for taking over um, as a technology director, as an instructional technology director, was to create um, a plan for technology, something that we could take a look at and know in a couple years down the road that this was going to happen or that was going to happen because in previous years that hadn't happened and we were almost kind of shooting at the hip a little bit trying to figure out what computer lab was going to get upgraded or what student devices were going to get upgraded. So I just want to let you know over the last year um, or so that we've been in this position. Um, as you know, we've restructured the department. Uh, things have been working far more smoothly uh, than what they have in, had in the past. Um, we have um, gotten down to help desk tickets of about 50 help desk tickets in the system at any given time, which in previous years that number was in the hundreds. Um, so things have been going very well with that side. Um, and then uh, in addition to that, as you guys know, we've really worked on the infrastructure. We've got our bandwidth up to where we need to. We've got our access points where we need to. We've got the projectors all now and the sound systems all in there. Um, and then the biggest thing that Whitney and myself have been working on is the adoption of 21st century digital tools and looking at those tools that can help our teachers in the classroom and fit nicely with our um, curriculum and what the Department of Teaching and Learning has been doing. And then the biggest thing this year with Whitney coming on board, we've really been able to increase our staff capacity. Whitney, um, about 85% of her job has been out in the buildings, um, really working with our teachers uh, to be able to build capacity. And I think if you asked any of our building principals here, uh, she's been a great asset um, out, in the, out into the building. Brian, before you go any further, could yes. you introduce yourself to our viewing audience? Um, I always forget about that because I'm the one that usually is behind the camera. Hi. Uh, Brian Seymour, Director of Instructional Technology. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. So one of the biggest things that I wanted to do moving forward was say, okay, now that we have the infrastructure built in and we've got the tools, what's next? So we developed a uh, technology committee and we actually developed two technology committees. One of them is the Executive Technology Committee in which we have 10 uh, members on and then the General Technology Committee in which we have 29 members on. And basically the mission of that was to support the implementation of the technology plan by ongoing review, modification, creation, and support, and support of the district instructional technology plans and procedures. So with that, um, we have created the document that I gave to you um, about two weeks ago to look over. Uh, we've had some conversations since then and what I'd like to do now is present our plan going forward of what that plan is. The biggest difference that I think that we've taken in this um, time over previous times is we really looked at it with the, um, the idea of teaching and learning first. And I think that was kind of the point of moving me over from being in the curriculum department into technology is to merge those two departments together so they're working together and the technology is not doing something that's independent of what's going on in teaching and learning. So that was really the first three months of our conversation was what do we want technology to be able to do for teaching and learning? We didn't talk about devices. We didn't talk about iPads or Chromebooks or anything like that. We talked about technology as a whole. How can it improve what we're doing in the classroom? And with that, we developed uh, the plan that you have in front of you, which uh, has a vision and mission statement for technology, future implementation plans, roles of the educator, uh, professional development, and uh, community interactions as well. So basically the vision of technology, we went directly off of the vision statement that the school district created last year and said, now how can technology support that uh, mission statement? So we're looking at showing mastery in all content areas as we start moving our way up through mastery-based uh, learning, increasing the skills in critical thinking, collaboration, and communication, uh, be prepared for the next level of education and successfully attaining the skills and proficiencies required of today's workforce. Um, so in addition to that, we've also started to adopt a model called blended learning, which we'll talk a little bit more here in a minute. The biggest thing was that connection with teaching and learning. How does technology work with the curriculum and how does the curriculum work with the technology? And I've worked really closely with Sharon and Julie and everybody else up in the, tech, in the curriculum office as well on this. And there's a few questions that we wanted teachers to start asking before they did anything with technology. And the biggest one of those was regardless of technology, what's the essential outcome of the lesson? 
That's the end all be all goal. What do we want students to learn from what it is that we're doing in this lesson? How are technologies, how are these technology tools enhancing the curriculum? We want to make sure that we're doing something with the technology, not just replicating what we've done in the past. What will students do with these tools during and after class? We also want to make sure that these were tools that kids were learning how to use later on in life, and it wasn't just, I learned it here, I used it in school, and I never used it ever again. Am I using technology in a powerful way? This is one of our biggest pieces. We don't want technology to be a direct substitution for what we've done for the last 20 years. I've had a worksheet. I've now taken that worksheet and put it online. That's not using technology in powerful ways. So this is going to be probably the one that's going to take us the longest time to get those teachers um, and administrators uh, to, uh, to start using technology in powerful ways. The other question is, how will, I, how will the use of this technology improve my teaching? And the big thing that we came away from here is it's not about the technology, it's about the teaching and learning, and the technology should be a tool to get us to those outcomes. There are going to be some outcomes that we're going to be able to reach because of the technology that we couldn't reach if we didn't have the technology. This is one of our biggest instructional models that we're going to start adopting, and this is called the SAMR model, and Whitney's already been doing quite a bit with this out into the school districts. But I talked about um, how to use technology in powerful ways. Well, this is a chart that kind of shows technology integration. And if we look here, substitution, this is the bottom of the chart, we work our way up. Substitution would be like I said, we've got a worksheet, and now I put that worksheet online. As we work our way up through these different ranks, um, we start to get to more and more complex, more and more higher levels of critical thinking, communication, collaboration, and starting to use technology in powerful ways. Really, once we get above that line, that line is where technology really changes the instructional model. And we've actually done some surveys on this, which I'll show you some results at the end. Um, and uh, right now, the grand majority of our teachers are at that substitution level. So we've got a lot of work to do. So talking about infrastructure, because that's the biggest thing. Before we say, hey, we want more devices or we want more digital technology in the classrooms, we've got to have an infrastructure. And I think we've done a very good job with that. We've got the high-speed connectivity to schools. We've got the high-speed Wi-Fi throughout our schools. And actually, this is kind of comical. If we look over the last couple of years, this is where we've been since fall of 2013. We were at 10 megabytes just uh, a little less than uh, three years ago. So we're now at 1.5 gigs, and the biggest thing that we're going to need with our infrastructure moving forward is that to be continually improved upon, to add on to it. And the cost for that, Ryan's working with some vendors right now, it's not a huge cost to start adding in additional um, gigs or half gigs. Um, we've done good with data and privacy, um, as well as we've got quite a few quality uh, digital content resources um, out there for teachers to use. There are three things that we need to work on continually going forward, and the biggest one is with our kids with the digital citizenship. With the world of social media and the world of internet and things being permanent, um, these are things and skills that kids definitely need to know, and this is going to be one of the biggest parts that we're going to ramp up in our instruction is working with, with kids um, in digital citizenship pieces. The other part to this is a home access. And one of the things with this, we did a survey of our kids, and about 92% of our kids actually have um, internet access at home. Now, those numbers may be skewed a little bit, because possibly the people that don't have internet at home didn't answer the survey, since it was an online survey. So we're probably somewhere in the 88 to 90% rate actually have internet at home. So how do we support those kids um, outside uh, of school? And then the other one is the high quality, low cost devices. How can we get quality devices in the hands of our kids? So here is quite a few of the different apps and uh, software pieces that we've used over the last couple of years. And as we move into using more and more technology, we want to go into a blended learning environment. So a blended learning environment is taking the best of the traditional environment and the best of a digital environment and putting them together. 
Um, Bob attended a uh, blended learning conference earlier this year, and there's a lot of different definitions out, out there about blended learning. And a lot of them said, well, if you put technology in front of kids, that's blended learning. That's not blended learning. Blended learning is the idea of sometimes they're on a device, sometimes they're not on a device. And as we started looking at that, we decided that there were seven different gears that we needed to focus in on. And in the, uh, in the plan, it gives you a lot more detail and look for so that we're going to start working with our administrators so they know what they're looking for uh, when they walk into classrooms. But as you go through these, these are support, instructional support and infrastructural support. If the device doesn't work, we can't do the instruction. If the teachers don't know how to use it for instruction, it's not going to make an impactful way. And then instruction comes along with that. We're going to have to train some of the kids. The kids are going to come far a lot, a lot quicker than what our staff will, and they're a little bit more willing to try things. The other piece to this is we're going to rebrand all of our professional development as Pickerington U. Uh, professional development sort of has a, a bad name, I guess you could say, to it. Um, and we're really going to work on this. We've hired, uh, we're, we're going to hire a company um, basically to come in and be able to do relevant, personalized, uh, professional development because we know that we've got teachers some of them are afraid to turn a computer on and some of them are okay get out of my way let me have as much technology as you can give me um, the other piece to this and obviously the most important there in the middle is the student learning we want to make sure that the technology is improving what we're doing in student learning I've seen research studies that um, obviously academic achievement we're hoping is going to improve we're also looking at um, hopefully discipline referrals along with the idea of PBIS. Um, hopefully those will go down because kids um, are a little bit more engaged with the technology. Um, in addition to that, we're also looking at learning environments. And this is something that I'm working with Vince on is if we want to do anything different in our school buildings, how can buildings and classrooms look different? Do they have to be classrooms in rows? Um, Kevin Honeycutt that we brought in uh, for the January 15th PD um, said basically that the idea of rows and, and chairs were, were there for custodian purposes so the custodian could get the mop and the broom through. Is that what we really want in instruction? So blended learning has a big piece with this as well. The other one is engaged communities. How can we let our parents know what's going on? How can we let our business owners know? Uh, how can we let other stakeholders that don't have kids or a business? And then the biggest piece to this is the idea of going one-to-one. -one. A device in the hands of every one of our kids to really, truly be able to do digital learning the way that it should be done. So once again, the goal of blended learning is to combine the best teaching practices from a traditional classroom to those of a digital classroom. The teaching strategies and tools should align to the goals of the learning objective. Does this mean that we need a kid to use a device 24-7 when they're in the building? No. If it's the correct tool, then that's what they should be using. But we want to make sure that we have this for every kid whenever it is that they've needed. So this is our definition of blended learning, or we're kind of also calling it tradigital uh, learning, blending of, tra of traditional and digital. So how are we going to get here, and what are some implications and uh, implementation plans? So here is, just as a reminder, some of our um, strategic plans that technology had written as far as the uh, PLSD strategic plan. And this plan basically talks about every single one of these in one way or another. So when we started doing this and we started looking at this from the technology committee standpoint, we looked at these things once again as the eye on instruction first. So we asked the group of, of teachers and administrators that were on the committee, what are you currently using technology for? What are the struggles you and your students face when using technology? What would you like technology to do that it currently cannot? If every student had access to a device, how would that change your teaching? And what are the parts and functionalities that would be needed of a device to make it to be used more effectively in the classroom? And from those questions, we were then able to start developing this plan of how can we help support our teachers uh, in the classroom and, and get our kids um, where the teachers believe they should be with technology. So we did a survey and we said, uh, one of the questions was, how important in your own classroom is it that a student have a device anytime they need it? So obviously, almost 70%, very important. 
Do you feel that your building currently has enough technology to properly be used in learning? And do you feel that you could be more effective if your students have access to a device 24-7? It's almost 50%, definitely. So we took a look at a couple different devices. And like I said, the device was the absolute last step. And we have decided that our goal is to have the entire district be one-to-one -one in six years. This will be kind of a rolled out type model. And with this, we also started thinking, well, does the entire district have to be using the same device? And the answer was no. We need to have the best device at those certain grade levels. So at grades um, pre-K through second, we've adopted the iPad mini. And grades three and four, the iPad Air. And at grades five through 12, the Dell Chromebook 11. Now, these plans will look a little differently. Like I said, we do want to go to one-to-one -one model. And at the elementary schools, the model would be that the devices stay in the building. So each teacher would have a cart of devices, and those devices would then be able to be used at any point in time during the day. Uh, currently, about every fifth teacher, every five teachers has to share a cart at the elementary school. So now every teacher would be able to have one. Um, the Dell Chromebook 11 would be a device in which the kids would actually be able to take home. So they would have this 24-7, and our goals with some of that is to extend the learning outside of our classroom and be able to have learning and be an anytime, anywhere um, environment. So I got two little quick videos here for you. Real quick, this is the Dell Chromebook 11. And just a little intro video here. This is um, this is a uh, four gigabytes of RAM, 32 gigabytes solid state hard drive. It's got an 11.6 inch touch screen, um, and then it's Wi-Fi and Bluetooth capable. So if you think back to when we had the devices at Ridgeview and Lakeview, um, those devices were first generation Chromebooks. They had one gigabyte of RAM. They had no internal hard drive. They were not a uh, um, touch screen. Um, basically, they were not a very good device uh, for students to be using. This device, if you take a look at it, is far more rugged, far more capable. Um, I used it solely for an entire week, and I only had to go to my MacBook twice to be able to do things that I, as tech director, have to do that couldn't be done on that. We gave that device also to a junior high kid that has destroyed four of the old Chromebooks. Um, I figured if it would survive with him, it would be able to survive anybody, and it came back looking almost brand new. So I'm very confident with this device. So here's just a little intro video on the Dell Chromebook 11. Encourage students to investigate their interests inside and outside of the classroom with the school tough Dell Chromebook 11. Engineered to excel in any learning environment, this Chromebook offers superior spill and drop protection for a student laptop. Thanks to Dell's rubberized trim and fully sealed keyboard and touchpad, the fourth generation Intel Core processor boots up in less than eight seconds and instantly loads web pages with the Chrome OS and Chrome browser. Students can stay in touch with teachers, collaborate with classmates, and access learning resources from the cloud with the full suite of Google productivity apps such as Docs, Drive, and Google Hangouts. With a 180-degree hinge, students can easily adjust their screen to enhance group work. Two USB 3.0 ports, HDMI, and an SD media card reader slot let students connect to various external devices to share content and projects. The first Chromebook with an interactive LED light system facilitates learning engagement. With easy-to-use Chrome software tools, teachers can conduct ad hoc verbal polls and be easily informed when students want to raise questions or provide answers. Best-in-class battery life ensures students are powered up from the first bell to the last. The Dell Chromebook 11 laptop, designed for collaborative learning. was that they wanted something that was very rugged, that kids obviously wouldn't break, wouldn't damage. There's a video out there, and I can't find it, unfortunately, that a tech director actually took one of these and threw it off of a third story window, um, and uh, threw it out in the parking lot and survived. Um, this that may is, happen. That may happen. 
Yeah, you never know. You never know. Give it to the kid. It's also got a fully 180 degree um, point to it so that kids can actually collaborate around it and be able to see um, as they go through it. The other part that I really, really liked is you cannot pick the keys off. Um, I'm sure everybody knows that the keys, thank you, okay, the kids like to take the keys off the Mac desktops and uh, rearrange them. These can't come off. And the other part to this, yeah, they like to spell naughty words in the keys. Oh, imagine that. that. So. so the other thing with this is that it's completely waterproof. Um, not waterproof, water resistant, I guess I should say. There's a small drainage hole on the bottom of this that actually allows, and I'll show you the video here, that the actually Dell allows Chrome 11 it has to thick rubber, rubber going all around the sides. The optional touch screen is super tough Gorilla Glass. This was designed specifically to resist cracking if kids put their pencils on the keyboard and then close the lid, which you know they're going to do. Dell also expects kids to spill stuff. You see this little drainage hole on the bottom? You could pour 16 ounces of water on the keyboard, wait 10 seconds, drain the water, and the laptop would survive. So, obviously when we introduce this to the kids, this will not be a video we'll be showing them. Yeah, okay. <laughs> exactly, right. But just to know that it does resist that water and we won't have to worry about those spills which are gonna happen um, it is a very uh, good selling point for this device. It's also got a bit that's interactive. So this front piece here um, actually allows the kids to control the color. So if I as a teacher am walking around and I said, hey, you know, if you're at a point where you can't move on, put your red light up, then what this does is this avoids the teacher hearing, Mr. Seymour, Mr. Seymour, Mr. Seymour from 8,000 kids as you're trying to help individual kids. You can just have the red light. You can also use it as polling software, all kinds of different pieces that this device allows that others did not. So how's this going to work? Okay, so like I said, this is going to be a six-year process, and it's going to be a rollout model. So in our first year, starting next year, we're going to do two elementary schools and grades five and six. We've decided to do the elementary schools a little bit different than the grade levels, just because it's going to be easier for us with so many elementary schools to work with individual elementary schools on the professional development level. Um, than what it would be for us to work with all of the kindergartners, teachers spread across, you know, um, seven buildings. So those buildings would be getting new um, iPads, and then the fifth and sixth graders would be getting Chromebooks as we move through. The following year, we'll then do an additional elementary school and fifth grade again. So every fifth grade year, they'll be getting devices, and then those devices will work their way up with students. So our expectations are that these Chromebooks will last the kids four years and that the iPads will last five years. Um, we're also going to do shared carts at the high school. Um, they'll need some um, new technology in there, as well, in there as well, and this will be a way for them to start to get some exposure uh, to those Chromebooks before you've got kids that have four years worth of Chromebook experience getting up into the high school. The following year, year three of the plan, we'll do two more elementary schools. And then once again, fifth grade. So then we'll have fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and the high school shared carts. And what we'll do during this time is we'll take the current technology, the current iPads that are in those buildings, and we will reallocate those to buildings that do not have devices yet. Uh, so for example, the middle schools. Each of the middle schools, I believe, have anywhere between 10 and 11 carts of iPads. Those carts will then be moved down into the elementary schools and a little bit into the junior high as we start to reshuffle. And eventually all of those carts will work their way down into uh, the elementary schools. So that way we don't have to purchase an absorbent amount of carts. We can reuse the ones that we already have. The following year, uh, we'll do the last two elementary schools and we'll be completely one-to-one. -one. Uh, we'll actually be completely one-to-one -one in elementary schools in year three with current devices and new devices but this year will be one-to-one -one with all new devices, basically. Fifth grade, and then you can also see ninth grade. So we're asking the devices to last for four years. So the kids will turn in their device um, in the summer between their eighth and ninth grade year, and then we will give them a new device, and we'll ask that device to last another four years. And then by the time we get to 2020, or 2021, we're now in fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, and tenth grade. 
And here now, we can actually go one-to-one -one completely. So in six years, completely one-to-one, -one, because what we'll do is we'll move up into the 11th grade. The 12th grade students for their last year will get the shared cart devices. And then that way, everybody will be one-to-one. -one. And then from there on out, we'll be one-to-one -one in every single building. Um, and it'll just be the recycle of every five years at the elementary school and fifth graders and ninth graders here on throw. So a couple more survey questions that we gave from our staff members. How important is it to you that the district implement a one-to-one -one program? As you can see, uh, over 75% said in, uh, very important or important. And do you feel that a district-wide one-to-one program would positively or negatively affect your classroom? And over 70% of the teachers said that they feel it would positively affect their classroom. So in addition to this, there's a couple other pieces that we need to allow the teachers to be able to monitor and be able to know what the students are doing if every student has a device in their hands. So we're going to also purchase the software called Hapara. And Hapara, what it does is it actually allows me or the teacher to go in and build a class list. And when it builds a class list, uh, the teacher would then go in and say, start session at the beginning of their class and it will pop up all of the kids, what they're doing on their computer screen. So this here is the written form, so each one of these boxes is a different student, and each one of these words is a different tab that they have open. So for example, this one down here, um, looks like it's got some kind of a draw program, this one's um, some kind of a sheets program, and this one's a doc. So I can tell exactly what each one of my students is doing. So if my student's on Twitter, and they're not supposed to be on Twitter, I know exactly what they're doing. And I can send, actually send Johnny a note through this program, and it actually pops up on Johnny's screen. And then if Johnny still doesn't want to get out of Twitter, I can actually X out of any single one of those um, pieces for them. The other side of this looks like an actual interactive piece, and you can actually now see what those students are actually working on. So this is the actual live view um, of their um, of their uh, of their desktop. The other things that this can do is um, we've all said, stood in front of groups and, and tried to give everybody a website, and we have to stand there and repeat it like ten times, or we have to write it on the board, and then they're like, "Is that an O or a zero or something like that?" This actually would allow me to go in, open up a new tab, and push it out to every single person that's inside of this session. Um, so teachers can get kids onto it rather quickly. Uh, the other piece is it also limits what websites they can go to. Let's say I'm doing research on animals and I'm on National Geographic and I don't want the kids to leave the National Geographic domain. I can actually lock down this app for the next 10 minutes. Kids can't go anywhere but National Geographic. So it's just another instructional tool that allows us to um, help uh, in the process of implementing technology. The other piece to this as we look forward is more in the high schools, and this is looking at um, uh, some different digital learning opportunities. Um, and one of the things that uh, the board has said in the past is that we'd like to look at some online courses. And one of the things that I'd really like to, to, to refrain from is just calling them online courses, and I'd like to call them digital learning opportunities. Uh, because we have multiple different versions of ways that we can use digital learning in the classroom. Online's a big one. We've also got hybrid, which is the way that most of us are probably taking college courses, um, where we're in the class sometimes and online sometimes. We've also got blended learning, which is going to be a big piece. Um, flipped classrooms, where the teacher videotapes their lectures in short segments and the kids watch them at night and then they come in and they actually do the work in the class and not listen to the teacher uh, lecture. Um, so this allows for more educational opportunities for students. Um, it also allows for more personalized um, instruction through adaptive curriculum. And it's a major paradigm, uh, paradigm shift in the pedagogy for teaching and learning because teaching online is dramatically different than teaching in the regular classroom. So we've got to look at those things. So here's the different models that I kind of talked about. And if you look in the beginning of, of, the, of, the, of the, um, the plan there, it gives you definitions of what all of these different pieces and parts do. But how are we going to get to these? Well, we've got a three-year timeline. 
and the plan spells it out a little bit more than what I've got up on here. But one of the biggest things that we want to do right off the bat is increase the use of, of Google Classroom. Google Classroom is our LMS, our learning management system, like a Blackboard, like Canvas, like Schoology, um, and it allows us to be the digital hub for all of our, uh, all of our um, lessons and ideas. So what should happen is, is as the teachers go through this one-to-one -one piece, they should be adopting uh, Google Classroom, and that's where all of their assignments should get assigned out of, that's where all of their resources should be at, so on and so forth. And we're going to do a lot more training on flipped classrooms, how to create those videos, how to make them so they're six to eight minutes long, and how to put those into a place where they can monitor if kids are watching them and when they're watching them. Uh, training on blended learning. Whitney's doing a lot of research right now on different models of blended learning and what those look like. And as those devices come into the buildings, we'll be working with those individuals on what blended learning looks like. We also need to start thinking about at the high school level, um, identifying high school teachers and courses that can be taught digitally. So what are some of those online courses and what teachers um, have the, um, the skills to be able to teach online? Um, we obviously need to do some training with those individuals. We need to look into, is Google Classroom a good enough learning management system for an online course? The nice thing about Google Classroom is it's free and it integrates really, really nicely with all of the Google tools. If we went with something like a Blackboard or a Schoology or a Canvas, there would obviously be a cost per student to invest in all those. We'd like to pilot some online courses during the spring of 2018 and then start in the 2018-2019 um, school year um, offering numerous online courses. So the goals for those uh, should be implementing a successful digital learning program to increase student achievement, enhance the curriculum, integrate technology to increase academic opportunities, increase the technology skills and knowledge of our staff members, and allow teachers, our students and teachers to have a, access to a device whenever it's needed into a blended learning environment. So the biggest thing moving forward that our teachers are going to need is the professional development of how do I do this? I've got, a, I've got 26 kids in my classroom. Every single one of them has a device now. This is a different world, different environment for them. So the biggest thing that Whitney and myself need to do is we need to have that ongoing differentiated, relevant personal, develop, personal development. And what I say with that is, remember I talked, we've got some teachers that are scared to turn their computers on and some that are way, way, way high flyers. I don't want to take this person's time teaching them at this level. So we're going to do a little bit of both. Um, focus on PD on three to five major technology integration areas. Um, we're also looking at the Google certification for all educators and administrators. And the new um, Certified Educator Program actually talks about how do you use these tools in the classroom, not just this is how you do Gmail or this is how you do Google Docs, how do you use it with students in the classroom? Both Whitney and myself have gone through it. It's phenomenal training. I'll be really excited if we can get 75, 100% of our teachers uh, certified. Uh, there is no school district in the, state of, in, the, in the United States that has anywhere close to 75% of their, of their staff members certified. The other part with, um, with Whitney, uh, we've got a lot of job embedded professional development. So Whitney's able to go out during the actual school day and work with those teachers uh, to model some of those lessons, to kind of give that little helpful hand uh, there uh, in those buildings. We're going to partner with uh, three different groups. Uh, the first one is going to be the Tierney uh, PD company. And what I like about this company is, is they will build the PD how we want it. We've already had a couple meetings with them. I'm very, very um, happy with what they're able to give us. Uh, they're going to be able to come six to eight times during the school year. And then during those times when they're not here, they'll actually be creating online modules for our teachers to be able to do. As well as, this is what, I, this is what sold me, is we will get a Google Hangout link that our teachers can use any school day between the hours of 7.30 and 4.30. And if they need help with anything related to the one-to-one -one program, they can contact, dial up this Google Hangout, and they will get one of those people that comes out to our building to be able to help us at any given time. 
And it could be something as simple as, hey, my kid's Chromebook won't turn on, or I've got this really cool lesson that I've done for the last couple years and I want to integrate technology into it, how do I do that? So um, I'm really, really encouraged with, with what they're able to offer us. Um, the other piece to this at the elementary level with sticking with the iPads, we're going to go with some Apple Leadership PD and I'm going to be working with those building principles to create what that PD looks like. And with both of these, we're going to create mentors. Uh, we're not going to do what's normally called train the trainer because that idea, I kind of feel that train the trainer is I come in, I train you, I leave, and you never see me again. I want mentors in the building that are going to be able to help, that are going to be able to be there if somebody has a question. And then the last one there is Quality, Matter, Quality Matters Digital Learning PD. This is going to be for the online courses. This is a really good um, professional development that helps us to vet um, content that's already been created or to create our own content. All right, here's some of the ideas of what Tierney's going to do for us over the, the first couple of, of um, times that they come in using devices in a one-to-one -one environment, using Chromebooks, flipped classrooms. Paperless classrooms, here's the other point to this. We are not supporting printing on these at all. So the goal with Google, I get some weird looks over there. <laughs> um, the point with Google is the idea that everything's shared and that we can communicate back and forth digitally over the idea of, of paper. And I bet you if you ask the building principals how much money, and you guys probably know, how much money do we spend on paper? every year, it's usually about a third of their budget. So if we can get that down, Hilliard, when they went one-to-one -one in their sixth and seventh grade buildings, um, they actually reduced their paper in the first year by 45%, and then the second year by 65%. Um, so hopefully that'll be a big cost, cost savings to us. <clears throat> the biggest thing with the teachers, with, with working with the teachers, is the idea, there's two pieces to this. There's one called the digital divide, which is where the, some kids have a device and some kids don't. We're solving that with the idea of going one-to-one. -one. The next big piece is the digital use divide. What are they actually using it for? Are they a consumer or are they a creator of the digital technology? And that's the biggest thing we're gonna be working with our teachers on is, are we doing passive using or are we actively using the technology once again in powerful ways? So the expectations and goals, the staff expectations, um, live and work in a blended learning environment. Have a presence in Google Classroom. Use the device as a teaching and learning tool with the key applications supported by the district. Use less paper, but not completely paperless. And have an open mind and be a contributor. So this is going to be new for all of us, and I got the opportunity to talk to some of the 5th and 6th grade teachers at a BLT training, and they were very, very, very happy with this idea of going this direction, and they were already coming up with ideas of things, oh, we could do this, we could do that, we could do this, and I was very encouraged, especially that last part of, uh, of all of us kind of going through this uh, together. So student goals, and I won't read all of these to you, but basically it's the same thing that we've kind of been talking about. Student achievement. Decreasing uh, student behavior, looking more towards student-centered learning, uh, personalized instruction, increase in student ownership of learning, uh, usage of learning data, 21st century skills, learning becomes a 24-7, 24-7, 365 event, expanding academic opportunities, having that presence in Google Classroom to get that skill of managing a digital classroom and a traditional classroom, and the continued expansion of digital resources. And then the biggest one there is the equitable access. If you looked at the, the survey that we sent out a few years ago, um, the area obviously that has the lowest amount of, of internet users and devices was in the Tucson area. So this is really where we're gonna be focusing a lot of our attention on is making sure we have that equitable access for all of our students. So staff goals are pretty similar. Increase in resource and tools, increase in support, ongoing professional development, utilization of tools in more powerful ways, um, a normal part of how school operates. This has to become almost as normal as paper and pencil did how many ever years ago. Uh, creation of an online digital repository. Google gives us the ability to start to share. Hey, I created this really cool lesson 
using this type of technology. Let's share it with others. Let's see what your, what, what your, what your lesson can do in other classrooms. Um, increasing the levels of technology integration through that SAMR model. So one of the biggest things that I heard the board also say was, well, we need to know how is, how is this working? How, do, how can we tell if this um, investment makes any difference? Well, we're going to come up with um, six different metrics that we're going to look at on a yearly basis. Um, the first of those metrics is what's called the ISTE Lead and Transform Diagnostic Tool. And ISTE is the International Society for Technology and Education. And this is more of a district uh, view of what technology looks like. These are the 13 essential conditions. Uh, so like empowered leaders, engaged communities, shared vision, uh, skilled personnel, so on and so forth, that ISTE has said that you have to have to have a quality um, technology, um, instructional technology program. So this was what we measured um, on 11-10 uh, of 2015. This is where we determined that the district to be at. And our goal for this is to, over the years, to slowly see those or to see those uh, bars continue going up. And once they get into the blue, that means that you're um, of quality uh, in those areas. The second one is the Future Ready uh, Digital Learning Readiness Tool. Uh, this is the one that Valerie, uh, myself, Matt Dansby, and Mark Gilbrook uh, got the opportunity to go to over the summer. Um, and as you saw in the update that Valerie sent out, we actually got recognized as one of the 44 schools that actually took what they were doing and actually put it into a really nice plan to be able to move forward with this. But when we do this survey, this survey actually breaks it down into these different areas, so now we can start to see some different pieces. And then there are smaller surveys that break down each one of these into multiple categories, and you can see that as you flip through the plan. So it gives us really good benchmark numbers of where we're at as a district between these two models. The next idea then is, is where are our teachers at? And the biggest thing we're going to measure the teachers on is that SAMR model that we talked about. So Apple has graciously given us a survey that when we get the results, we can actually measure our teacher's level of integration into the classroom. So this is the results that we gave it. We gave it um, back in November. Um, and it asked the teachers a lot of different questions, and it ends up producing a graph like this. Uh, blue is substitution. That's the bottom level of the um, SAMR model. And then green is substitution augmentation. Yeah, um, orangish color there is augmentation. Uh, and then the dark orange and the red is the redefinition and the modification, which is really where we want to get to. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of blue. So we've got a lot of work to be able to do to get our teachers using technology in powerful ways. So we'll run each one of those three surveys every summer to determine where we're at and what we're doing. The other piece that is brand new that you don't have in front of you is um, an individual that I ran into at the technology conference. It was actually the very last session of the day. I decided to walk into this one and um, ended up getting um, a college professor from Walsh University, uh, Dr. Fiala, um, who worked with North Canton School District on a straight A grant. And what they did was they took the ISTE standards, um, which are, they have their own technology standards, they broke them down, deconstructed them, rewrote them in student-friendly language, and it then measures the student's perception of how technology is um, improving their learning. So now we've got the district, we've got the staff, and now we've got the kids. Uh, Dr. Fiala has already been paid for this at the Straight A grant. We don't have to pay her a dime. Uh, she is more than willing to look, uh, work with us. Um, the problem is North Canton, uh, they only got 50, uh, 55 or so kids to actually do the survey uh, because they asked the kids to go home and do it at home uh, and they didn't push it at all. So she was like, well, there's nothing I can do with that. I need hundreds or thousands of kids. So what we can do is we can do this. It's a 10 minute survey. Uh, the kids that do the one-to-one -one program uh, will get this survey. Um, and Dr. Fiala is willing to do all of the analytics for us and get us a really nice report. Uh, the only thing that will identify a kid is a number, or just a random number that will be generated, and we'd like to do a longitudinal study of how this technology has impacted them as they go through. So what are we asking for the board? 
Um, and Ryan may be able to speak to this a little bit better, but the money has already been allocated in the five-year forecast. So I've been careful to work with him on what, what it needs to be to, to, to do um, money-wise what's here. So the biggest thing is, as students get devices, some of them are going to break uh, for one reason or another. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to put together a technology fee, or kind of like a insurance policy. And um, after I talked with a few of you, the original price was $35. I think I'd like to cut that down to $34 because we've got the idea of we still have the technology fee for software, which is $6.50. And we'd like to try to cut that down to $6, so that way for technology, they're just paying a flat $40 fee. But this fee here will uh, be only for those kids that are in the one-to-one -one program that are taking the devices home with them. So first year, it'll just be grades five and six, and then eventually it'll expand through grades five through 12. What it'll do is it'll allow for two accidental occurrences, the screen breaks. Um, the sound doesn't work. They get something stuck inside of the um, headphone jack, something like that, something small fee, or um, one complete replacement of the device. Okay? After those have been expunged or whatever, then we'll have to start charging individuals per whatever the cost is to, to get those fixed. But that will be the insurance policy for those students every single year as they go through this. We have done some um, insurance with outside companies, and I'm sure if uh, the junior high folks are here, I'm sure they'll, 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 they'll tell you that that is a pain in the butt uh, because we have to send those devices away. I'd much rather be able to send a tech over, get it fixed in 10 to 15 minutes, get it back in the hands of kids um, without having to send it away for five or six days and then get it back and so on. When a device does break, we're going to purchase some extras that we're going to call loaners. So that way if a kid's device breaks, they bring it down to the office, they hand the device that's broken, we hand them a loaner device, and boom, they're back in the classroom, they're logging back in, it's all on the cloud, so they don't have to worry about what's on the actual device, and they're ready to go. The only thing that will, would be different is if the device is completely lost. Now, through some of the software, I can track some of these. If they get lost, I have to put them in a certain mode, and then I can ping them on the internet, and we can find out where some of these things are at. We can also completely deactivate it. Uh, so if a device becomes completely lost, we have to reallocate that money to get that back because of the leasing company that we're going through and those types of things. Go, go back to that. Yes. If it's completely lost, mm -hmm. What is the burden on the student or the student's family? It would be the fair market value. Okay. Because what will happen is, oh, is. is. most right. of the leases that we're running through, and I'm finalizing which leasing company we're going to go with, um, most of the devices after the four years will be turned back into the leasing company. Right. And to be honest with you, I really don't want a four-year-old Chromebook laying right. around the district. Right. Um, no, I'm not worried about that. My question is um, the student will yep. be responsible for this device. It would be the fair market years. value. Yep. Yes. Correct. All right. And that also comes along with the charger as well with this. So if a kid loses a charger, that would count I'd as one of the... I'd buy a lot of those. Yeah. 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 And then the other piece to this, and, and Ryan can speak to this. I think I talked to a few of you. Um, each year there'll be, a, there'll be three four-year leases that I will ask for your approval. Um, once again, sticking in that same budget. Um, but we'll have a lease from Best Buy. Uh, which will be the Chromebooks, accessories, and the management fees. Uh, we'll have a lease from Apple, uh, which will be the iPads, the keyboards, um, laptops, and desktop computers. And then uh, a, a lease from Tierney Brothers, which will be PD, software, carts, lockers, iPad cases. I get confused on this four-year lease for the Apple products. I thought you said they were on a five-year life cycle. They are, but we're going to do them on a four-year uh, lease. Okay, so the lease does not necessarily tie. Okay. Correct. Right. Yep. Yep. So with that, that is our plan to move forward with technology over the next 10 years. Okay. Brian, can I ask a question? Yep. I was just going to say, no, go ahead and start. We'll start with uh, 
with questions or comments or other than great job. Um, go ahead. Yeah, it's, it's it, it was a great job. Thank Obviously, you. it's a lot of work. You've invested in time and energy into figuring this out for us. I just have one question about, you referenced inter increasing internet access. Could you tell us how that works? If they don't have internet access. So at home? Yes. Okay, so one of the things that we're doing is I'm actually currently working with the Chamber of Commerce. We are creating a survey that we're gonna send out to all the area businesses that have a um, Wi-Fi, open Wi-Fi, as well as a public space. So Barnes and Nobles, um, the restaurants, things like that if they will allow our students to have access to their Wi-Fi. So then that way what we can do is we can create a map and students will then know what some different areas are in Pickerington um, that allow students to come in. Uh, David Ball created a really nice logo for us that lines right with the district logo. We'll create stickers and be able to put those um, in there. That's part one, that's the easy part. The second part is, is that most of our students have, that don't have access to internet are mostly generated up in the northern portion the, around the, the Tucson Road area. So some of the things that we'd like to look into, and we have to look into some legal references and things like this too, is how can we support some of the apartment complexes that are up there? Are there devices that we could possibly, our older devices, could we possibly give those to um, apartment complexes? When we start to get to internet access up in those areas, then it starts to get a little weird because our internet has to be filtered if we pay for it. And going with an apartment complex to say, hey, we'll filter your internet, that's something that's kind of out of our out of our realm right now. But we could possibly look at devices or what other support that we can give uh, for that, that general region to be able to support uh, internet. There's also other options. There's a lot of different, um, there's a company out there called Kajit that sells these little teeny tiny things that clip on your belt and actually give out a Wi-Fi signal. Uh, the problem, though, is, is we have, have a monthly fee on each one of those, and they are fairly substantial when we start looking at, you know, if we're looking at 10% of our student population, we're looking at 1,000 kids, um, and I don't think we want to pay for internet for 1,000 kids for home. Uh, the other thing that we could possibly look at is looking at um, allowing our Wi-Fi signal to extend outside of our school buildings so that kids could come um, during non-school hours and sit outside of the buildings and be able to access uh, our filtered Wi-Fi. So there's a lot of different things that we can look into. It's just looking at the legality issues that we have to do with SIPA and COPA and, and trying to figure out what we can do. Okay, I must have misunderstood what you said about increasing internet ac access, because I have seen from 2013 what we did. But there's something in the program or in your presentation about they could download a certain amount to their device and take it home they would have access to it? Yeah, what, one, of the, one of the things that people are scared about with the Chromebooks is, is that you have to have a Wi-Fi signal for most of that to work. That's incorrect, because what we could do is, let's say I as a teacher am assigning a Google Doc for you to create. So you've got a, just say it's a graphic organizer. What I could do as a student, if I don't have internet access, is I could load that graphic organizer onto my computer, don't shut out of that window, but just close my computer, when I go home, that'll still be there. I can fill it in, once again, don't close it, and then come into school, and then as soon as I come into school, it loads it right on the Wi-Fi. So there is kind of ways around it if those kids are thinking before they leave where there's Wi-Fi access. Yeah. Michelle, were you thinking about the broadband width, the growth of the broadband? Well, internet access, to me, access. That's access. internal, that's internal, yeah. Versus, versus what he was talking about. Yeah. Which is the folks at home. Yeah, okay. Yeah. I, I, I thought you were asking a different question. I was, but he corrected me. By the way, it, it was an excellent presentation. You guys have done a lot of hard work on this. So, Thank you. Uh, talk to, can you take a minute just to talk? I, I assume these weren't all just your guys' ideas. You, Modeled after some you stole some ideas. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, the, talk to us a little bit about where some of this stuff came from. Why you you know how who are we who are we trying to compare this to? Who are we stole it from? Who are we who are we trying to read? You see what I'm trying to where I'm getting at here? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, Whitney and myself have made lots and lots of site visits to different schools, and the the one that really opened our eyes where we went down to Chillicothe High School. 
Um, and Chillicothe High School sponsored a uh, Google Summit, which was really the way, if you would have asked either of us before we went to that, our idea with the Chromebook was the model that we had at Ridgeview, which we would have said, never again, we're not doing this. But we went down there and we saw um, Chillicothe High School completely one-to-one. -one. Every single kid had a device, and it was, they were only in there, like, they were only 15 months into their implementation plan, and it was like those kids that had those devices every minute of the day. So we picked everybody's brains that we possibly could down there. Uh, we actually got connected to with some of the, two of the Google ed techs, which there's six of them nationally. Um, and since then, we've actually taken that and met with them numerous times. Um, I can't tell you how many emails we've gone back and forth with Google about helping us get into this. And we had a meeting um, just two, three weeks ago at the tech conference, and Google has said, I guess when you put in a purchase order or a request for pricing on 1,800 Chromebooks, Google finds out, uh, and they come knocking, uh, and they have scheduled a meeting specifically with us, and they have said that if you need anything at all, Google is there to help us out. So in the meantime of doing that, we also did a lot of visits at Hilliard. Um, Hilliard is one-to-one -one with grades six, seven, and eight now, and they are releasing 8,200 devices next year to go one-to-one -one with all their high schools. Um, so I have picked uh, their technology director's brain so many times, and a lot of this stuff, you'll see some references in there from Hilliard's one-to-one -one plan. Um, they're probably the model in central Ohio to look at. Um, I've also talked with uh, Lancaster. Uh, Lancaster's high school is one-to-one. -one. Um, Marysville, um, I've talked with Chris Deese, who's their technology director a lot. Um, and I've also talked with the new, new, uh, new Upper Arlington tech director because they just went one-to-one -one with all their high school kids with MacBook Airs. So those are really the big school districts now uh, that are going. There's also quite a few smaller school districts that I've reached out to, Indian Valley, which is a school district of about 2,000 kids. They've been one-to-one -one for four years now. So I was really talking to Brian Didfield, their tech director, of, okay, well, what does this look like in year three or year four? Uh, what do the devices look like? How does the management look? How does it look like when you've got your entire school district one-to-one? Uh, -one? So a lot of these ideas are not my, you know, ingenious ideas. A lot of these are stolen ideas from other school districts. Great. Other questions? I've got a number of questions, but someone else Oh, has no. To oh, go ahead. Time. Unless somebody wants to go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Um, the rollout, I assume you, again, probably saw different people do the rollouts, different mm -hmm. plans and stuff. I'm really curious about the elementary rollout, doing it in phases. Yeah. The first blush would be that if you've got two or three schools here, you're almost going to have to start. The other schools are always going to be behind. There, there's a, you, you said that it, it was best, but I, I guess I don't understand why. Yeah, so the elementary rollout is a, a four-year rollout with actually three years till they get one-to-one -one with current or old devices. There's really two reasons why, why we did that. One was the support that they would need by going one-to-one. -one. So in the instructional technology world, it's Whitney and myself. So we did not want to say, hey, year one, we're going to roll out five buildings because we would not be able to support those five buildings with changing all of those mindsets that they would need to change of having a device in their classroom every single day. Uh, the other piece to that also was a financial piece. So where can we look at you know, financially uh, to be able to help support those. But the biggest thing was is I didn't want to do a rollout because I've talked to so many tech directors that said, oh, we had all this money and we just rolled out all these devices and they just sat there or they used them for, here's a worksheet, now I'm putting it online and we're really not making any difference to it. I thought if I'm going to do this, I want to do it right. I want to be able to be there to support those buildings. We're going to make a definite concerted effort that we are going to be out in those buildings as much as we possibly can. If I have an hour free here, an hour free here, I'm going to be at those, those buildings to be able to help support what it is that they're trying to do. Right. Um, you mentioned the online high school courses. Mm -hmm. What's the end game you're hoping to get there? Is it that? students will be able to take some classes online to free up more time during the day or to, to be able to get out of school to do something and take those up. Both above, you know, 
What is, is there an end game to that? I, I think that's going to be kind of defined as we go through, um, but there is a lot of different pieces that we can look at. We can look at we can offer courses that maybe we don't call, we don't offer during the normal day. Let's just pick an example, I don't know, Chinese. Let's say we don't offer Chinese right now. Maybe we could offer Chinese online. The kids could get that opportunity to do maybe outside of the normal school day. It could be the opportunity for, you know, a lot of colleges now are, are asking schools or asking students to do online courses and our kids are not getting that exposure. So maybe it's just the idea of, hey, if you're gonna do an online course, Let's get you trained a little bit of it in high school where you know you have the support, not just when you go off to college and there's some professor behind the curtains doing, doing what you're doing. Um, it could be, a, you know, it could be a staffing thing. It, it just depends on what we look at and what our ideas are of online courses. All right, and uh, certified education. So it is a online course, and it kind of depends. It's one of those things that depends on your level of Google, uh, Googleness, or whatever you want to call it. Um, it could be I, for me. It took me about um, two weeks to go through the different modules for the course, and then there's a three-hour test at the end, and you have to show mastery on this three-hour test to be able to get your Google license. Yeah. Yeah, I would love to be able to see by the end of next school year, close to seventy between seventy five percent and a hundred percent of our teachers have uh, their Google Level One certification. And I built into my budget that I'll pay for every single one of those teachers to take that test. It's a ten dollar test. All right. My last question: um, the we're going all this the colleges, universities, tech schools. You know, where the next level of our students is going. Yeah, it, 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 it's interesting when you, I've had the opportunity to go in and talk at a couple different universities uh, since I've been in this position about what technology looks like for um, new pre-service teachers. Every single one of them has a laptop in there or an iPad. Every single one of them has, every college or university has some type of learning management system that all their work is done completely digital. Even in my classes that, that I'm taking now, um, it's, it's a hybrid level course. Part of it's online, part of it's, um, part of it's in. So I think that the, the, the difference is gonna be is they're gonna get a better experience with the blended learning here than maybe what they would in a college or university where that professor maybe has an online course, but that professor maybe has 300 kids in an online course. Um, I want to reiterate the, um, my um, feedback on this plan. Uh, I've mentioned to both Valerie and Brian a couple of times and others that this is um, this is just superb and and whether or not you agree with every part you know every word on every page this is a lot of work and this shows that um, this district is committed to educating forward as I think our little tagline says or it used to at one point um, and the importance of integrating technology in in the teaching and learning process which will carry with people um, through the rest of their lives that being said, um, I want to clarify the fact that you do have um, costs built into your budgets for professional development each year. Correct. I thought I recalled that from the teeny tiny <laughs> uh, spreadsheets in the report. Um, the other question I have, though, has to do with the internal. So that that's going to cover your vision for professional development. Correct. For Pickerington University. Mm -hmm. or Pickerington U. What, what is it called? There's another word you use, another phrase. Pickerington U. Yeah, it was someone else. Um, the other question I have has to do with staffing. Um, my hunch is we can't move forward with this over the next 10 years without probably increasing our instructional tech staff to a certain degree. Not that you'll get it all at once, like next year. 
-hmm. But, um, so, and I know you and I have talked about this, yes. and I'm wondering if you've given any further thought. To yes, I have. Oh, Valerie, okay. if you wouldn't mind. Oh, that was a nice tag team. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you can pay me later. So one of the things that when Kathy and I had talked about this was looking forward at a possible um, org chart or possible staffing um, changes that may be, may be impactful to help, to help us out with a little bit. So the front page of this basically has, as you know, the instructional side and the infrastructural side um, was split. So you can see those two pieces there. Um, Vince is going to be talking more later on about the infrastructural side of things. Uh, when he does his presentation in April or May. Um, so he'll, he'll bring that part up. So I really want to focus on the left-hand side, which is the instructional technology. Um, so if we, so we've got myself, we've got Whitney as the instructional coordinator, we've got Ed Delp, who is the technology resource leader, which he is almost solely responsible for Infinite Campus. Um, so he's really not out into the building doing what he was originally supposed to be doing, which was kind of like a Whitney's job. We've got our technology teachers, which are formerly the Git, which I agree we need a new name for. Um, and then our building technology advisors, which is that um, stipended position that each one of the buildings has. Yeah. So if you look at the next page, the next page um, is would be next school year. Uh, one of the biggest things that I believe Valerie's talked to you a little bit about is data. Um, and some of the issues that we've had with our data and some of that goes around with the idea of just staffing. So one of the things that I'd like to do is as I am foreseeing Ed Delp retire at the end of next, next school year, um, looking at bringing somebody in to take some of those roles um, and be trained by Ed um, to be able to support data full go. So that's where that data uh, and systems, uh, student systems analyst comes in there. So are you proposing next year to have, I see what you're doing. So you would propose to add that position next year? Correct. Beginning in the fall? Correct. Oh. Correct. And uh, Bob and myself have worked on some rationales and Bob's going to be taking that to the uh, uh, some, uh, staffing personnel. committee, personnel committee, thank you. Um, and then basically everything else for next year kind of stays the same. The following page, um, with the retirement of Ed Delp, I'd like to um, basically eliminate that position, um, which is a the technology resource teacher on special assignment, and replace that with another instructional coordinator very similar to the job that Whitney's doing right now. So that would keep us with uh, myself, uh, Whitney, um, whoever that new person would be, and then the data person would be the, the main four at the, at the district office level. In addition to that, I'd like to start looking at additional technology teachers um, and looking at um, adding two additional technology teachers in this year. And what I would like to do is assign one technology teacher per each of the middle schools full time, and then have the other four technology teachers uh, be at the elementary schools. What that would allow us to do that is would allow us to eliminate uh, the BTA position at the three middle schools. And then the following year, kind of looking at the same model of adding three more technology teachers, which would then give us a technology teacher at every grade level, K through six. Um, and that would then also eliminate the BTA position at the elementary school. So obviously this is kind of what I would like to see, and obviously there are some things that we need to work through. So um, just kind of an idea to, to get you thinking about what would be, what would be nice to, to have as we move forward with the technology plan. First comment I have on the personnel is, is back to preparing us to other, other schools and similar size schools and stuff and what they have. Yeah. Well, let me just say that Hilliard is kind of the model in, in Columbus. Um, <laughs> I'm almost, almost afraid to say this, but um, Hilliard, uh, they have a director of technology, they have a coordinator of instructional technology, and then under that person, they have, I believe, it's 14 technology specialists, which basically do the job that Whitney does. 
And then on the infrastructural side, they've got a few network people, and they've got, I believe it's somewhere in the low 20s for techs. We have three. So not that I'm saying we would ever need to be that far. Not that we're saying you'd ever need to be. <laughs> because we're not that large anymore. Well, <laughs> as Hillier. Yeah, they're 15,000. So they're you know 5,000 more than we are. But still, um, that's kind of an idea to look at. Um, other schools are all over the place. It just kind of depends on where they're at with their technology integration. Um, a, lot of, a lot more schools have more technology teachers, which is actually one of the things I would rather like to see is more technology teachers and less district office folks. Because um, one of my other thoughts was I would like to also see, you know, if I was shooting for the moon here, um, like to see technology kind of mirror TNL. And if TNL has a coordinator at this grade level or this grade level, then I'd like to see a technology coordinator at those grade levels as well. Um, so I would rather see the teacher in the classroom working with the kids than having that coordinator position. So your goal with those technology teachers um, is akin to the, to the goal of the PE teachers, which is one-to-one -one at the K-6 level. Correct. And I would see that technology person being teacher slash coach. Okay. So. When you say that Ed Dell spends all of his time, or the majority of his time doing infinite campus, and then you eliminate that position, is the new person going to be doing Infinite Campus and more, or are you phasing out some of Infinite Campus? No, no, unfortunately we're going to be increasing more and more in Infinite Campus. So that person, the data and student specialist, um, his, his or her responsibility will be to work a year with Ed and take on what Ed has been doing uh, over the last couple of years, and then slowly by the end of the year, um, that person take all of Ed's responsibilities and Ed can start working back into the classroom. Um, as he's, some of those pieces um, are kind of released to the data person. Okay. Make sense? But then he's going to retire. But then he'll retire, and then hopefully the idea would be is to get, you know, another coordinator to be out in the classroom helping with integrating technology. One other question about professional development. Um, um, are we going to build in some sort of, and I know these are two different animals, but either a, tra a tracking mechanism or an incentive mechanism or something, because according to the little pretty colors on your bar charts, mm -hmm. we have a ways to go yeah. to um, encourage and get our teachers to the level of technology knowledge, if you will, that we, you know, have built into our vision. So um, the kids, I think somebody's already said it, you know, they're, they're going to pick it up like that. Yeah. So it, it just, sometimes for us it takes a while mm -hmm. for, you know, teaching old dogs new tricks. Not that I'm old, but, you know, it's just hard. Yeah. With all their other duties and requirements. I mean, it's important. So we need to incentivize it probably somehow. I don't know. There's a couple things that we're looking at. We're going to run a couple boot camps over the summer oh, okay, for great. teachers that are starting with the one-to-one the -one program. Great. And if they attend one of the boot camps, they'll be the first ones to get their hands on one of these devices. So great. that's one thing. Um, there's also the idea of that Google certification so they can use that. It's called a digital badge. Uh, Whitney's been looking at some things, too, about how can we create what's called a digital badging system, which basically is like a sticker chart to a point. Um, of, you know, if you achieve this many PDs, you get this type of badge and so on and so forth. And then after you get so many badges, you get something. A Starbucks. Yeah. We're looking at two. Um, Valerie can, can talk about, um, we've got some new tools out there too. One of them is these really cool virtual reality goggles uh, that she actually bought a, bought a pair for her grandkids. And one of the ideas is, is let's purchase some of those kinds of tools once the schools have reached such and such a level. Yeah. So if we get to 50% of the school is Google level one certified, they get 
X, Y, and Z for their building to be able to be used. Once we reach 75%, they get X, Y, and Z. So there are different pieces like that that we can put in that would help to support this in the fact of that we, we all, a lot of times we talk about technology as the device itself and not about all the other accessories and pieces and parts that can come with it. So those incentives could be the accessories and the pieces and parts that we don't, we don't necessarily talk about all the time. or something that we, so that sort of, which I don't, I think is a little different, right, than this, this doesn't, that doesn't necessarily have to do with instruction. So that's, it's my understanding, limited as it is, it has sort of a login process, so you Correct. prove that you've attended the class, are we going to, is that a similar, will we have a similar setup like that with some of these online PD it, it depends on what we what we adopt okay. yeah okay. yeah we're looking right now the hard thing is trying to find an online course um, that talks about how to use technology in the classroom yeah. for teachers yeah, right. there's a ton out there for kids but there's not a lot of them out there for teachers and, and adults um, so maybe it's something that Whitney's been doing a really good job of, of doing classes on uh, Google Classroom for teachers. She's got, how many do you have working now? Six different classes working right now, and she's probably going to launch another one tomorrow um, that have, you know, 30 plus teachers that have all signed up for right. how to use these things. So yeah, we will we will make sure that we have metrics on who's yeah. doing what and so on. I think it's exciting. It's great. Good stuff. All right. Yeah. Others? Okay. okay. Um, then I believe if there's nothing else,